Good morning, everyone. Uh, hope you guys are doing well. It's been a nice long conference. It's been an exciting conference, I hope, for all of you. It's, it's time to get back to work, uh, work on a lot of the experiments uh, of all the technologies we've seen, maybe lose a few buffet pounds, maybe pay off a couple of gambling debts, just saying. <laughs> but this is Vegas, right? Uh, all right, so I wanted to talk about how we are addressing uh, secure and dynamic configuration, application configuration at GapTech. Uh, that mugshot is me. I head the uh, platform services team at GapTech. Uh, my team is primarily responsible for broad platform capabilities that uh, enable uh, teams like Phil's team to get to production quickly. So we're talking about application config, we're talking about API gateways, uh, Cloud Foundry, cloud enablement, and so on. Uh, the pretty guy right under me is Spencer, right out back. He's grown a beard now. Uh, I, I wanted to call him out because he's been instrumental in uh, getting us to where we are and helping us uh, drive forward as well. So if you've got any curveball questions, Spencer is right there. <laughs> All right. What is Gap Tech, right? So, you know, Gap is a retail brand. It's, it's a family of uh, retail brands. What exactly is Gap Tech? So, Gap Tech is the organization within Gap that supports the technology needs of essentially the entire Gap family of brands. We're talking about corporate systems here. We're talking about uh, planning design systems here. We're talking about POS, e commerce, and analytics as well. So, end to end. It's a significantly sized organization, a few thousand people around the world, several hundred apps, and going into microservices, we're talking about thousands of services here. So quite a bit of scale. Uh, the presentation I'm giving today, the solution I'm going to be presenting today, uh, it's in pilot right now. We haven't widely adopted it yet. We're still working through some chinks, so uh, I hope to come back and uh, do a retro once we get this all out and scaled. Uh, standard disclaimer, uh, Gap as a company policy, we don't, you know, Gap doesn't endorse any of the products or the solutions we're talking about here. Standard stuff. At this point, you guys are probably wondering, this is a really cool shirt I'm wearing right now, and how can I get one? <laughs> <laughs> So we've got a Banana Republic uh, sale coming up. Friends and family, Phil's been handing out some uh, coupons for that. So we can all be shirt, shirt buddies, all right? <laughs> all right, plug, done. <laughs> you were, right, weren't you? <laughs> all right. Fun crowd today, awesome. All right, so here's what we're going to go over, the business problem, what we're trying to solve, how we're going about solving it, and what our next steps are. I'm also going to go over a couple of gotchas uh, that uh, we faced and what we're doing to work around those as well. And there'll be a Q&A uh, block towards the end, but if you guys have any questions in between, just raise your hand. We'll, we'll do this as a conversation. All right, app secrets. What are app secrets? These are your database username, passwords, uh, your API keys. You, you want to connect to a third party API, Facebook API, your, your keys, and then you have your access tokens as well. Uh, so, what are our requirements for app secrets? So, there are several ways to do this. Uh, what we wanted to do, though, as the platform services team, is we wanted a distributed platform capability. So all of our different development teams don't have to worry about this. I like to call it the path of re least resistance. If, if a team figures a better way or a different way to do it, more power to them. If it's actually a better way, we will consume that as a part of the platform and spread that out to the rest of the organization. It needs to be secure, at rest, and in motion. It needs to be consistent. So different instances of the same app, current and future instances need to get data, uh, these configuration consistently. There needs to be deep access control. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, essentially we need, we're, we're at Gap, we're going through this transformation of empowering our teams and making them as self-sufficient as possible. 
At the same time, what we don't want to do is have teams step on each other. So when you're looking at a secrets back end, you want to make sure that that team only has access to the secrets that they need to have access to. And they don't have the ability to overwrite some other service or app secrets. Uh, we need an audit trail. This is, again, a huge shift. Traditionally, what we've done is uh, we've had uh, a CAB, a change management board. And every change uh, has been going through that CAB board or the release management team, making sure uh, there is uh, auditability to that. The approach we're going towards now is, is a passive audit trail. So you can still meet your audit requirements, you can still meet your compliance requirements, but this can be a passive audit trail that you can get to and you can rely on, rather than having a team in between that you have to work through. Uh, we are primarily looking at Spring Boot, Spring Cloud apps. Uh, we've got some uh, non-JVM apps as well. Uh, you know, it, those are nice to have at this point of time. What's dynamic config, right? So again, most of you guys are probably familiar with this. Uh, you got your feature toggles, your branch by abstraction. Uh, you've also got your kill switches. Shut it down. Something goes wrong, shut it down. Uh, that's a hard requirement for our support teams as well. It's something that we don't currently have. Uh, again, because it's not a platform capability, we don't have it across the board. But you know that would be a really nice to have. Again, what are our requirements here? Distributed platform capability. It needs to be timely. This is huge, right? So when you make a change, it needs to go, uh, go through in milliseconds or seconds at most. It needs to be consistent. All current instances and future instances have to uh, have the same configuration. The, like, you know, once you make a change, they have to have the same configuration. This is something in my past experience, it's bitten us quite a bit. Uh, again, deep access control, audit trail, because you know, you're dealing with PI apps here, PC apps here, you've got to make sure. Not only do you know who made the change and when, but when that change was actually consumed by your instances as well. Again, Spring Boot primary and non-JVM, nice to have. Spring Cloud Config Server. Uh, have you guys been to Spring Cloud Config Server talks uh, that we've had? We've had a few of them. They were amazing. Uh, so it's essentially, you know, you get server and client-side support for externalized configuration. It's really scalable. There's PCF tiles for it right now. It maps straight up to the abstractions of environment and property source in Spring, so that's great. You can leverage either app configuration properties or refresh scope. It really depends on your use case. And we'll kind of touch on both of those a little bit as well. Uh, if you've missed the talk uh, Clint gave yesterday, uh, this was about config server and extending it. You should definitely catch it on YouTube once it goes up, because there's, there's quite a bit of uh, good information and setup information there. I actually don't have time to go through a demo in this talk, because it's a really short talk. But uh, these other talks have gone through uh, like, you know, essentially a lot of the setup uh, steps and gotchas that, you know, I think would be really valuable for you guys. Challenges. All right, Spring Cloud Config Server is amazing. What are the challenges, though? So, backend, Git. Uh, Phil actually brought some of these points up if you caught his presentation uh, a few minutes ago. It's you get local uh, time, uh, commit timestamps. You don't know when the, uh, the change was actually pushed into your production instances. Git is really a shared log, right? You can mute it. It does not pretend to be an audit log. Uh, you, it kind of turns it, uh, you know, if you use a Git as your backend, it kind of turns it into a tier one prod system. I mean, Git should always be a tier one system, but now you're talking about impacting your production. Let's say if your e-commerce site, billions of dollars in revenue, you don't want, want to go there. There's also a bunch of overhead that you're going to have to take on with your support teams and your security and audit teams to make sure that you've got the right lockdown policies, that you've got deep ACLs, uh, and you've got the processes in place to, to manage those. 
It's not built for secrets management, right? You've got to hand encrypt. I mean, there's a bunch of tools that do that. Uh, actually, if you caught Premier Health's uh, talk on uh, monolithic architecture to Spring Cloud and microservices, Travis uh, like went into quite a bit of depth on what the challenges are with Spring Cloud Config backed by Git and uh, how they've solved it, how, how they've worked around it rather than solved it. So, so that's a good uh, talk to catch as well. I inserted all these talks in yesterday, so my decks are a little updated now. All right, so this isn't a new problem. I'm sure all of you have faced it several times in your career. I have. I've implemented solutions for this at least four times that I can count, uh, every time proprietary. We're like, all right, let's go build it again. And then we started talking to Pivotal about Spring Cloud Config server limitations. And we were like, nope, let's collaborate. All right, let's come together, build a turnkey solution. You know, nothing is, I'm never going to have a, as big a team as the open source community. So I'm never going to be, uh, you know, like essentially my f feature speed is always going to be slower than the open source world. So why don't we just collaborate, build something out, let people collaborate on it as well. and. Uh, you know, and everyone's the better. If you guys want to collaborate on this project, Spencer, right there, go talk to him. I'm sure he'd be happy to get some help. <laughs> All right, so let's start on App Secrets, right? So, Walt, how many of you are not familiar with HashiCorp Walt? All right, so HashiCorp makes Vagrant, Packer. They also make Vault and Console. Uh, so it's, it's really a, it's, it's a stateless application that, you know, that, you, that securely stores secrets and it, it exposes an HTTP API. You can store your secrets, you can retrieve your secrets. It essentially abstracts away your secrets management problem. So you don't have to worry about that or you don't have to build that capability. There are ways, even with Vault, there's ways to actually uh, and even with Spring Cloud Config Server, right? There's APIs you can leverage to encrypt uh, your, your password or your secrets and then decrypt them on the fly. But again, there's a bunch of manual steps in the way. Uh, what Vault also gives you, and this is huge, is it gives you an audit log. And it gives you a nice, clean, simple, sanitized audit log. You know exactly when something has changed. You know exactly who changed it and you know exactly when something got pulled and consumed, right? You don't get the values in there. Again, that would be counterproductive. Uh, uh, but you, know, you, you get that audit log to, to satisfy your uh, audit policies and your uh, change control needs. You get token-based fine-grained access. Uh, this is, again, huge, because more often than not, you, you've got your service accounts that are going in and getting your uh, information, your, your secrets, right? But when you have to revoke permissions for, for whatever reason, there's been a compromise, you're going to have to change it in a lot of places. You know, your service account is usually embedded in a lot of places on a lot of tool systems. What you can do with Vault is you can tie your service account to a token, and you can revoke the token at any point of time. So if there's a compromise at the application level, it's a compromise not on the service account, but a compromise on the token. So you can always revoke that token. Uh, there's LDAP integration. So if you're doing AD authorization in your organization, which I recommend you do, uh, you know, you, it, it works seamlessly for you guys. Uh, you can do highly available clusters with, with some backends. Console is one of those backends which supports high availability Vault clusters. Uh, you can seal Vault. Uh, that, I mean. It, it would have to be one hell of a, a security break in if you have to seal Vault, but that capability is there. And when you seal Vault, essentially the API shuts down and uh, nothing can get access to the secrets, which you know even your uh, applications won't. But you know, in case of dire situations, it's a good to have. Uh, Mark actually, right back there, had a great talk yesterday on managing secrets at scale. Uh, he went quite uh, 
a bit into setting up Vault and the, the advantages and essentially the gotchas in Vault as well. I recommend you read that. Uh, I'm sorry. I recommend you watch that talk as well. All right. So all right. So you got Vault now. How do you integrate that with Spring Cloud Config Server, right? So Config Server now has Vault as an environment repo. So th this is not Spring Cloud uh, Config Vault. This is Spring Cloud Config Server with Vault as an environment repo. This supports property styles, so you can do keys or you can do blobs, and you can do nested keys in Vault as well. Uh, what you got to do, though, is your application is going to have to pass the, the access token over to uh, Config Server to actually fetch the, the configuration tree from Vault. You can still use multiple backends here. It's not a, you only have to use Vault. So if you've got standard configuration, you can set up in the same Config Server, you can set up both a Git backend and a Vault backend. And your secrets are fetched from Vault, and your standard configuration get or your static configuration can just get you can get that from Git. So it's not a either R situation, which is really great, I think. Uh, usually with secrets, I mean, if you're if these aren't dynamic secrets, if these are static secrets, you can just use configuration properties for that. Just make sure that you mask your secrets in the in the environment endpoint so that if you know, someone hits your service endpoint or the service environment endpoint, you don't get those secrets exposed. So this is our flow. Uh, really what we're doing, and earlier Phil was talking about Fed CI, that's our federated CI system, that's our orchestrator right here. So what we do is, and again, Mark covered this a little bit in yesterday's talk. Uh, so what we do is we generate an app ID and a user ID and map that to a service account or a set of service accounts on a path in Vault, right? And the app ID is a, it belongs to the application. The user ID belongs to the orchestrator. A combination of that lets you get your uh, service account back in the orchestration context itself. Now you leverage that service account within the orchestrator to generate a token for your application to use to fetch its app secrets. Try not to put your uh, service account within the app for it to go get the secrets. Try again uh, leveraging the token system. So that gives you the flexibility to easily revoke access at any point of time. Uh, so once that comes back, once you get the, the application token back based on your service account creds, you can just uh, inject that into the app, and uh, you know when your app is uh, calling on uh, Spring Cloud Config Server, it's just going to pass that token. Now, if you're using configuration properties, it's going to do this at, at startup. Uh, if you're using uh, refresh scope, it's going to do it on the slash refresh endpoint. At startup time, again, you're just passing the token, and it's just fetching the, the configuration from Vault as needed. All right, console. Console is another product by HashiCorp as well. So we're using a wall console combination, and I'll kind of go into why. You don't have to use console as the backend for Vault. You can, there, there's several systems available. You can use MySQL. You can use file system if you want. Uh, but just to leverage synergies between our different application configuration uh, problem sets, we're using console. We're using console in this context as a a key value repo. We're not using it as a service discovery mechanism, though that's totally possible. Again, uh, uh, Spencer had a great talk on that as well, uh, switching from Eureka to console for service discovery. Uh, console is distributed, highly available. It is data center aware, and I'll, when we're going through gotchas, I'll, I'll go over that a little bit. Uh, it's highly scalable. There's health checks. It needs to form a quorum. Uh, you can define the size of the quorum, and uh, yeah, and then it makes sure that it's healthy. With yeah, go ahead. So yes, 
So we're using Vault and console in a DR model. So you still write through uh, a single Vault. And I'll go through some of the challenges we've, we're facing and uh, we've faced and the decision we made. And we're actually working with HashiCorp to, to fix that going forward as well. But I'll, I'll get to that as well. All right, this is the fun part, right? It's in progress. Uh, we've, we've got the watcher. Uh, I mean, it works right now, but, but there's a few uh, chinks in that that we still need to work on. So, so this is the Spring Cloud Config Console Watcher, right? So this is actually on the Spring Cloud Config Server. So, and this has been a, con a consistent theme in a few talks about Spring Cloud Config is, all right, I'm using at refresh scope. How do I refresh uh, my configuration? How do I hit that refresh endpoint? Uh, a lot of people have overarching orchestration systems uh, that, that manage that whole context somehow and manage hitting that refresh. We don't want to go that route. So with dynamic configuration, when we made that change, we wanted the system to inherently refresh. So with console watcher, that's what you get. So you've got a watcher. You inject a path into uh, the watcher. So every time there's an event that gets fired, that uh, something has changed in that console path, you can essentially have a config server trigger that slash refresh. And all of that happens automatically. Again, there's a few gotchas. It's still in progress. Uh, it works really well uh, for, uh, like, you know, for a small set of apps. But once you're talking about enterprise scale, hundreds of apps or thousands of microservice apps, then you know, there's some challenges we're still going to have to work through. You can also define polling times. So again, watch is a polling model. So you can do it every 15 seconds. It really depends on uh, how often and how quickly you want your dynamic configuration to get updated. Uh, quick note, so there's some, like, you know, there's some gotchas with at, at refresh scope, right? So you, you don't want to put every configuration under that. Uh, you only do it for configuration that you know is needs to be dynamic for an X amount of time, and then you are probably better off moving that to configuration properties after that. So every time you hit the refresh uh, endpoint, your, your constructor will get called multiple times. You, you need to have a, you need to be aware of the life cycle of uh, the configuration item as well. Uh, no, this is actually to do the configuration refresh itself. Okay. Yeah. So I actually switched over from. So I actually switched over from secrets management to dynamic config. I probably should have. I'm not sure if I said that. Uh, so we're still going through Walt to do our dynamic configuration, though not all dynamic configuration is secret. But we essentially want to go to that fourth quadrant, saying, you know, we want to do. Dynamic secrets, right? So this is essentially our update time flow. So you know you set a watch on a path, you give it a time, uh, a polling time, and then you know essentially config server is going to continuously poll uh, console on that particular path. So let's say your orchestrator or a user comes in and changes. Uh, a configuration item in that path, there's an event that gets generated. And Spring uh, Config Server is watching that event on console. Again, since we're going through Vault, the, the, the value is going to be encrypted. It's just the event we're looking for. And that event is going to trigger the, the refresh. And then on lazy load, next run, the application is going to reach out to Vault. You can do like you know, Spring Cloud uh, console here as well if you really want to. But we just want to make it a consistent experience for our developers and our support peeps. And then you get the configuration back. You get a beautiful audit trail through and through. And, you know, and the watch keeps on. So the next time you change the item, the same cycle happens again. Does that make sense? Go ahead.
Yep. Yes. So that's what we're doing, right? So essentially, we've got, we're treating, treating this as three different problems and then seeing if we can leverage synergy across them. So you got your static configuration. You either put that in Git or you can put that with the application itself. It really depends on your preference. If you're using like metadata-driven UI, for example, then you would want to put it in config server. If it's static and it's never going to change, just put it with the application. Then you've got your app secrets, and those have to be fronted by a system like Vault. Then you have your dynamic configuration, which can be either secret configuration or non-secret configuration. Uh, that's what we want to. That's what you either put through Vault, but essentially it, it ends up in console, and you're watching console for that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Couple of gotchas. Uh, this kind of bit us uh, quite a bit, actually. So, console is DC aware. Uh, if you do, essentially, that there's two options of doing console, right? So you can either do uh, uh, essentially a ring around multiple data centers, and then the the DC awareness kinds of bite you a little bit. Particularly if you don't know where your application is going or you don't care where your application is going, you want to just spread it to whatever DC. Uh, you want to make sure that your configuration is consistent. So you can use uh, an, uh, a DR setup of console and you can set up replicate. Replicate is going to be one way only. The, so, so that's one got you that we, we got with console. The other one is with vault caching. So when you're actually updating values in Vault, you want to do that in a single cluster. So let's say you've got two clusters across multiple data centers. If you update it uh, using one Vault, it won't actually update the cache of the second Vault until you restart that second cluster. So, so that's a big boo-boo, to be honest with you, particularly with our focus on going to several cloud providers. Uh, so, so we were working with HashiCorp and trying to fix that going forward, but that's something you need to be aware of. So what that means is you always uh, write to and read from a single wall cluster, not a distributed wall cluster. Uh, there's some problems in the console uh, watcher as well right now. So, so we have over notification. Again, this is two parts. One is if you want to do deep multi-tenancy, you know, you want to use the same uh, Spring Cloud config server uh, setup for multiple applications, and again, the same Vault and console setup for multiple applications. You will get a lot of uh, over notification, and then they'll hit a lot of refresh, and then, you know, your, your applications are continuously lazy loading their configuration. That's, uh, it's all right, but it's not ideal. So that's definitely something we're working on. Versioning strategy is important as well. So, I mean, there's two ways about this, right? So, one is, I mean, with Git backend, you, you, I mean, Git is a version control system. You get a solid version, versioning uh, mechanism there. But with uh, console, that's not true. So, what you've got to do, or what we are doing, and again, different organizations are different here, is we make sure that. Even with different versions of the application, we always go with the same configuration and then either change the configuration before deployment or after deployment. It's very interesting once you start talking about experimentation and blue-green. How we do that is, or how we're planning to do that is with uh, configuration or toggle weights, essentially your feature flag weights, rather than uh, a capability in the backend platform itself. Token rotation. What happens if you, uh, essentially, if you want to uh, revoke the token that you've uh, stuffed into your application, right? That's a little bit of a challenge. You may potentially have to redeploy your application, particularly if you're if you're dealing in a uh, in the PCF space or in the Docker space, uh, where you you can't really control your instances. They get spun up. They are to scale. You may have to go through a redeployment there. 
All right, we've got some interesting, cool stuff next up, which is all the gotchas that we're, we just talked about. We're trying to solve those. We're working with HashiCorp to get uh, a UI app as well for the support team, the, the easy button mode. Uh, we're also working with Pivotal to see if we can set up smart clients for uh, non-JVM applications. Python, Node, .NET, we use these extensively. And we're also looking at a new PCF tile to essentially spin up uh, Spring Cloud Configs over the new version uh, on your PCF as well. All right, I am right on time. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> Any quick questions? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? OK, so there's a few ways of doing this, right? So the orchestrator actually generates the token. And if you guys are getting late for lunch, I hear lunch is fabulous. So <laughs> I can al also catch you guys upstairs. So uh, the orchestrator has the token. It's using the, the service credentials or whatever to, to get that token. Now you can inject that token into the application configuration. You can inject that token as an environment variable. It really depends on what your deployment environment is. So in PCF, we just inject that as an environment variable. So it gets, uh, it becomes a part of the droplet. So every time there's uh, scaling instances, it's the same token that, that gets used. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, what? Okay, I, I mean your deployment mechanism has to be secured as well, and we actually use ephemeral deployment mechanism, so, all right, I'm done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, thank you, thank you very much. No, <laughs> so, I'll, I'll finish that answer. I'm, hold on, one second. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we use ephemeral uh, orchestrators, so every time they die, everything dies with it. So we're not actually storing it. Uh, we're not persisting it anywhere. You generate a new token. Uh, cool. OK, claps now. <laughs>